My name is John McInnes. Um, I'm a writer, producer, director, currently making a horror movie entirely in uh, Unreal. And with this production, we're rethinking how a movie is made, distributed, and consumed using the technologies that are available to all of us. Today, I'm joined by Patrick Palmer from AWS and Christopher Burns from Nextera. And we're going to be talking about the next generation of cloud computing tools, um, collaboration tools that AWS and Nextera are developing for filmmakers and creatives like myself. So why movies? It's an it's a, it's a obvious question considering we're making movies um, using game engines rather than games. Well, for most of a decade, I've been asking why not movies. Ten years ago, I was a screenwriter on the path to writing big studio movies. I'd won the Academy Nicole Fellowship, the biggest screenwriting competition in the world, and I was eager to see what studio gig I was going to be writing. The first gig turned out not to be a movie, but a video game called Call of Duty. So working on Call of Duty turned out to be the biggest education I could have had in terms of 3D, immersive, photorealistic digital avatars and environments. I was blown away by what we could do in a game engine, and so my question was, why not make movies in game engines? But it turns out gamers were only interested in making games, and movie folks were, well, horrified at the idea of making movies in, with, using video game technology. But not everybody. Zoe Saldana, the star of Star Trek and Avatar, uh, had optioned a couple of my scripts, and she was no stranger to using new technology to making movies. So we threw around a few ideas of what we could make, but Zoe got busy with a couple of small movies like Guardians of the Galaxies and The Avengers. So coming to this, I come at this as a screenwriter, so my primary interest is human characters. So I spent a lot of time making photorealistic, real-time digital humans. This was back in 2016. We were working at Unreal 4.11. We were mostly making virtual reality because virtual reality seemed like the new frontier of storytelling. And I had funded a couple of VR demos that got us a lot of interest. NVIDIA, HTC, AMD all used our VR experiences to demonstrate cutting edge room scale VR with real time photorealistic digital humans. It was these early VR demos and my work on Call of Duty that caught the attention of Harry Shearer. Now you all know Harry Shearer from his work on The Simpsons over the last 30 years, doing half the voices on The Simpsons. So Harry had this idea of doing a weekly political satirical TV show where he would play all of the characters. Photorealistic avatars would enable Harry to play Trump, Obama, or anybody else he wanted to play. And real time would enable the quick turnaround that we would need in order to, for, to do a weekly show. My team made the digital avatars, and I bought the A-team of real time, Cubic Motion, Ninja Theory, with support from Epic Games and NVIDIA on board. That making of that TV pilot proved what was possible, but it wasn't quite ready for prime time. So why movies? Well, so far, I've talked about how game engines are an important tool in creating content beyond gaming, but movies and 2D linear rendered content in general is equally important in expanding the use and value of game engines. Game engines need movies and non-gaming media to be more than just a tool to make games. Now, we often hear that gaming industry is massive, and if you've made a career in the space, it's easy to think that gaming and gaming culture is everywhere and everything. But it's amazing that there are still huge swathes of the population that know nothing about gaming, and I often hear, particularly from people over 30, that, oh, I'm not a gamer. But everybody watches some kind of 2D linear content, whether that's movies, TV, YouTube, TikTok, whether you're two or 92. The 2D linear video is the original cross-platform, transcultural, transmedia. So it's super low friction with a multitude of ways in which, we can, can, in which content is being produced, and there's more of it than ever. So if the future is game engines, then movies and 2D linear media could be more important to that future than gaming. Now, every generation of filmmakers uses the latest technology available to them to express themselves. In 1995, Lars von Trier held up the Sony VX1000 mini DV camera and with his Dogma 95 manifesto announced it as the future of cinema. Now that statement was a little overblown, but those movies succeeded in shifting our common held ideas about what a movie is. And looking back, those films anticipated YouTube and the explosion of user-generated content a decade later. 
12 years after Dogma 95, Paranormal Activity, shot on DV, became the most profitable horror movie of all time. The first in the series was made for $15,000 and went on to make $200 million at the box office. The franchise as a whole has made nearly a billion dollars. The game engines have the potential to revolutionize the way we make movies, how movies are monetized, and how they are consumed. Innovation over the last couple of decades has largely been at the high end of expensive studios, but I believe that the changes taking place now and over the next decade will come from below, from creators like us, forming communities around tools like Unreal that are freely, av freely available to all. Companies like AWS and Nextera are building tools to enable workflows for these creative communities. So why now? Well, as we all know, the current model of movie creation and distribution is broken. Success is measured in not how great a movie is, but by corporate growth, the number of subscribers to a platform, rather than how engaged an audience was with a movie. Artists and creators also no longer have a stake in their work. At the same time, the technology to making great movies are in our hands. Game engines, cloud computing, AI. We are a globally connected community of creators and we have an abundance of platforms and technologies such as Web3 and blockchain to reach audiences and monetize our work in ways that have never been done before. In an era of churning through streamer pages, something new, something creative is gonna stand out. In a climate of risk aversion, taking creative risks is our competitive edge. And we have the power in our hands to reap the rewards from that. So what if, what if we leaned into the tools in our hands? So what if we leaned into the tools in our hands? Not just supplant legacy technologies, but use these tools to tell stories that can only be told this way. Digital avatars, mocap instead of live action, virtual cameras instead of optical cameras. What if instead of looking over our shoulder and mimicking the movies from the past, we created movies with their own aesthetic that break from the past? Now these were all thoughts that were rattling around my head in 2020. Uh, this all sounds great, but there's a problem. Now nothing gets made without the basic building blocks of our equation digital characters and environments. Again, remember this is early 2020. Metahumans were still a year away and the Unreal Marketplace was a fraction of the size it is today. Now at this point I've been producing content in Unreal for nearly five years, but all of these amazing cutting edge digital characters and environments that we had created had served their purpose and were now sitting on high dri hard drives doing nothing. i would recently shared some of these precious assets with Mac Worman and and uh, to see what he could do with these assets. And as you can see, the results were amazing. Then it dawned on me, well, what if we gave away our precious assets to anybody who wanted to make something with them? So remember what 2020 looked like? Well, we were on full lockdown. All production was completely frozen. Nobody was making anything. Nobody was doing anything. And nobody knew what was going to happen. The only way that we remained connected was through technology. So what better time to launch the real-time shorts challenge to prove what we as a community could do virtually, remotely, and globally with real-time filmmaking. <clears throat> the idea was simple. We provide some high-level digital assets, and you have 30 days to make a short film. Epic, Faceware, Glassbox all came on board with prizes, and I asked a bunch of my notable friends to be judges. A few weeks after announcing the challenge, we had 180 people from 26 countries all around the world. At the end of the 30-day challenge, we received 30 short films. The challenge proved what we, as a global community, could achieve, not just in terms of what got made, but who made it. Of the top 10 filmmakers, half were women, and the majority of those women were women of color. Funny how if you circumvent the established traditional paths of creation, that other folks can make their presence felt. But the established industry was not ready. I created a movie slate of scripts from the blacklist, Hollywood's hottest unproduced scripts that I thought that we could resurrect with Unreal. But everybody felt that this was too risky to do something unproven. Then last year, I convinced an established director to make his movie for $10 million in Unreal. But greed, ego, and traditional mindsets got the better of them. So if you make things the way you've always made them, 
you're only going to get what you've already got. And what you get is creative stagnation. Churn, wash, rinse, repeat. An experience has just showed me that this established studio system was not going to be our solution. We'd have to make our movie outside of the system. That turned out to be extremely liberating. But what sort of movie should we make? Now, remember I said that Paranormal Activity was the most profitable, ho profitable horror movie ever? Well, part of its success was because it turned what was perceived as an inferior technology, mini-DV, into its core identity. Horror works because it plays with our perceptions and expectations. We use technology to create images of ourselves and of the world that only over time seem natural and real. Now, no doubt Tim Sweeney was fully aware of the schism in perception he was opening up when he named his engine Unreal. So if, we create, if, if we're creating a reality using Unreal, what better way to scare the shit out of people than by setting our movie in a terrifying backrooms virtual simulation? With that in mind, any Unreal environment under the right circumstances can suddenly feel terrifying. <coughs> so our horror movie is comprised of six distinct environments. The poor souls that find themselves in this simulation go from one environment to another. And we can, of course, build amazing environments on Unreal, but we don't really need to build very much because any, everything that we would, might want to use probably lives here on the Unreal marketplace. So by curating off-the-shelf assets for each of these environments, I was able to launch a new 30-day Unreal challenge to essentially crowdsource this part of production. Modding, kit bashing is a huge part of gaming, so why not approach filmmaking in the same way? Participants pick one of six curated asset packs uh, with a few ba vague descriptions from my script. They created a short film, a mood scene. Brands jumped at the chance to come aboard because the participants were exactly the folks that they were trying to reach. What better way to put the products in the hands of the best people, of the people best able to utilize them? At each step, we aim to create value for everyone. And that then translates into value for our production. And then 30 days later, 30 mood scenes arrived. And the best of these were selected as the backbone of our movie. I didn't have to pitch my story. I didn't have to give anybody a log line. I didn't have to mention the genre or even who was in it. Yet 30 days later, we had the basic layout of our movie for 1,200 bucks of UE Marketplace assets. I created a following for my movie. I created a group of developers with a stake in seeing our movie succeed. The people who participated, even if they didn't win a prize, gained a piece of work for their portfolio that they could be proud of. They challenged themselves, learned something, gained skills and experience. These are the sorts of people that I want to work with. They're passionate, motivated. And it doesn't matter who you are or where you are. It doesn't matter if you're a seasoned veteran or a noob. Your work can have value and a place in our movie. So this is Connor Buchanan, based in Boston. He was a full-time stay-at-home dad with four children, a wife and a dog when he started with Unreal. And Connor was the overall winner of our real-time movie challenge. This is Alina Benjanaru. This is a mother of five. Now in 2012, Alina left her job as a character technical director with a major animation studios to find greater satisfaction in being a full-time mom. Ten years later, she returned inspired by what she could do with Unreal and was accepted into the Unreal Fellowship. Luke Delamere and Kevin Stewart, they were live action DPs who learned Unreal for our 2020 challenge and ended up winning it. Kevin and Luke have gone on to carve out careers as Unreal cinematographers. And we had developers and teams from all over the world. Tato, led by Peter Bukowski, is a team based in Poland who won their category in the real time movie challenge. So all of our developers, all around the world, and our McKinnis Studios regulars, form a mosaic workforce that is fluid, adaptable, and responses to both the needs of our production and the needs of our artists. When we talk about production lines and workflows, this language implies linear progression, stages of production, top-down hierarchies, division of labor, and specialization. I see what we're trying to do is more like cooking. Sometimes we're working from a recipe, sometimes not selecting ingredients, combining ingredients, experimenting, seeing what works with what we have. 
Now, when I meet an artist or developer for the first time, I always ask, what is it that you want to do? And I try to meet them there. Monetary rewards are important, but money is only one thing we get from work. Work should be as much about discovery as it is about labor. I want to work with people who are curious, who want to explore, people who bring themselves to everything that they do. And I want people to take something away from our collaboration. Our collaboration should be a springboard for your creative and personal fulfillment, whatever that is. <coughs> Unreal has enabled us to rethink how we make movies, and now cloud computing is giving us the tools to reshape how we work together. It can free us from time and space, enabling us to have a fluid, dispersed global workforce. It enables decentralization and diversity. As a director, I can get a macro and micro view of my movie and see it coming together in real time. It means I can take more of an iterative approach to constructing my story. As a producer, I can monitor our progress, set realistic goals, manage remote teams, and get a real-time overview of where my production is at, while at the same time building interest and support by inviting investors, studios, and distributors to see exactly what we're making and how. I'm now going to turn it over to Chris Burns from Nextera to talk about the infrastructure that they built to make all of this happen. Chris? Thank you, John. Uh, so, in around 2005 or 2006, the game industry started shifting its mentality about games. The, at, speaking at GDC around that time, 05, 06, we pitched the notion that games were rapidly becoming cinematic events. They were movies where the viewer controlled the main character rather than what they were seen as at the time, which were game experiences with cinematic elements sprinkled in for spice. Uh, titles like Bioshock, uh, Fable 2, these are some early adopters of this notion. And they used film and theater techniques for staging and performance, which ultimately led to animators getting actual footage to work from. So now, it seems like we're coming full circle. Movies are now being made with game engines as the core component to the storytelling process. And as a filmmaker, this is a really exciting time. So John set out to kind of explore the boundaries of this new frontier, what could be done. Breaking with tradition and convention, all along the way, he set out to make a movie without much of the typical encumbrance that comes along and bogs the creative process down. I wanna to talk to you a little bit about the tech that supported that endeavor and a little bit about its evolution and what the future might hold. So John assembled seven teams all around the world. They were, uh, I'm sorry, as a first step in these waters, the, uh, I just lost my track. The, the teams each had uh, local workstations, probably pretty similar to what you guys are working on now. They're running Unreal Engine, they're running Perforce. As a first step into these waters, one of the things that we did is we lifted Helix Core out into the cloud so that John and his team could get an overview of the project as a whole while we maintained individual work streams for each team. It looked a little like this. This is my, my glorious diagram. Um, you know, you can see you've got, you've got your, your workstation sitting out there in your home office, maybe in the production studio. It's connecting over the wire through AD for security and into this, this uh, Helix core server. And one thing to notice here is that passage over the wire, it costs, right? It costs for egress, it costs for time, right? So what, what does this look like if you're new? What if you don't have that workstation? What if you're a small studio and can't necessarily outfit machines like that? What if for whatever reason you don't want to install these tools on your local machine? Whatever the reason is, you might move to a cloud-based workstation. So we take that workstation, put it up into the cloud, it's backed by a GPU instance, it's running all the same tooling, and now you're connecting through some VDI protocol. 
the VDI protocols have become pretty extraordinary and highly responsive to the point where you can use things like substance and get you know, pressure sensitivity and angle and all of the things that you're used to working locally still works in that environment. The nice thing with this, if you notice, that line connecting that cloud-based workstation to Perforce, there's, everything is happening inside of Amazon's network. Data is never transferring over the wire, you're just seeing images of it. So right away, we get a performance and cost benefit because there's no more egress for all that data that you're moving around. I, and one of the other really important things here is this, this significantly hardens our security posture. Right? If data is never moving across the wire and it's completely behind AWS's curtain, you're benefiting from AWS security right away. All right, now, once you're in the cloud, we now have access to a whole new world of possibility. This is a much more robust production environment Let's call it a studio in the cloud, all right? Your workstation is there. You have available access to render farms, to shared storage, to AWS backup, just a multitude of other tools. Adding these things in, because the system is modular, things snap in nicely and adding on new technologies becomes very easy. Now this, for those of you that want more details, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but this is, this is kind of a, a good architectural overview of what happens. If you're not familiar with VDI, you've got your workstation here. It's running one of these protocols. It's gonna connect over into a load balanced uh, uh, VDI gateway, managing your licensing and everything. That gateway will then, uh, you're, you're hitting that via AWS uh, through uh, Active Directory, AWS Directory Services, let's say. Um, you get routed from that gateway down into another load balance, or I'm sorry, from the, from the gateway down into a load balance VDI broker, which ultimately connects you to that workstation in the cloud. That workstation, once you're there, you've got access to all your tools down at the bottom. And if you notice, everything is contained within an availability zone which means you get high availability. It can be placed someplace close to you, wherever you happen to be. So latency, things like that get optimized out. And now you're really working in kind of a, a studio that you can connect to with pretty much anything that supports that protocol. It could be an iPad, it could be a Chromebook, it could be a laptop or a desktop. So why do you wanna do this? There's a lot of, of great benefits here, and a lot of them, in, in doing this work, there's, there's these inherent benefits that we don't necessarily notice, and they come along for the ride. So let's, let's talk just really quickly about security. There have been some highly publicized data breaches in the industry that I'm sure you guys have heard of. So once you are within that network perimeter, your data stays secure. You're not moving it around, you don't have the opportunity for interference or, or man in the middle, any of those, those sorts of things just disappear. Now, you also have full control over this system. So just because you have this intense security model doesn't mean you can't let people in or let things happen. You've got control over this. You're just getting a lot of this for free. You also have the shared responsibility from AWS. So if you are hosting your own data center, if you're hosting your own render farms, any of that stuff, you're worried about your equipment, the physical equipment. That's all secured. Don't need to worry about that either. And then finally, things like, you know, people often ask about what happens if one of my artists who's working in wherever, Vietnam, plugs a, a USB drive into their, uh, their machine and copies my assets. You have control over that too. So you've got a relatively sophisticated model where your information is safe. Everyone is using the same hardware. So Patrick and I were talking, when you've got machines that are running different video cards, different drivers, consistency becomes a thing in your render output. That goes away, right? 
Because the workstations are all spun up using infrastructure as code, we can automate the creation of them. So you need another one for whatever reason, you hire somebody new, here's a workstation, nice and quick. And lastly, you've got a single point of support. So if, if there's something wrong, a driver needs to be updated, you update it and everybody benefits from it. There's no more running around installing drivers all over a bunch of machines scattered around the office or around town, wherever. The system is modular, and that's a key ingredient. All sorts of new technology can be snapped into place. Next year has got solutions for a wide array of tooling that you will commonly use. A lot of it's geared at the gaming industry, but the M&E space is starting to use the same tools, and we're breaching into uh, more M&E related tool chains. The decoupled infrastructure, because everything is modular, it allows you to optimize on a very granular level. It allows you to scale on a very granular level. And then finally, it sets you up for integration for new technologies. Right? So anything that can be snapped into there with some sort of a wrapper around it that fits into that CITSE, that Studio in the Cloud ecosystem, you suddenly will have access to without having to worry about all the headache and overhead of establishing it. This gives you access to a global talent pool. Right? This is the, kind of the core of what John's working on. You can hire people from anywhere. You don't have to worry about procuring, provisioning, shipping, recovering hardware. The workstations in the cloud let people bring their own machine. They can have the crappiest laptop in the world and it still functions well for them. Fully managed data proximity, right? I wanna put the data close to my workers, the latency goes down. And then the really nice thing, and this is, this is kind of an exciting thing to me, having done a lot of onboarding and offboarding of people, it, it, it's one click. I bring on a new resource, they've got their machine, I spin up a workstation for them, they get access to that workstation, and when they're done, I tear the workstation down, goes away and they no longer have access to it. That, that's an exciting proposition to me, especially as it opens up that global talent pool. And then finally, we hit on some things, so performance things. So you have access to high performance machines from anywhere in the world. You wanna go on vacation? You could touch your machine if you wanted to. You happen to be lost somewhere? Even if you don't have your computer, you can go into a library and connect if you needed to. The automated and manual scaling allows you to handle a variety of different workloads. Scaling can be fully automated. It can be done all the way down to a completely manual process if you'd like and anything in between. As we talked about earlier, support becomes a lot easier. It's a little change to your infrastructure, your code, and the, any, any support issues can be ironed out from that. Your data is always close by. We've got data transport modules that keep data moving around transparently, so no matter what you're doing, we're always optimizing latency. And then finally, in, within our, our particular system and ecosystem, we have very detailed performance monitoring and cost monitoring, so you can keep an eye on what you're actually spending. Right? You can watch out for machines that are running long or abandoned. All of that is highly visible and easily remediable. Now that modular aspect, there's a lot of cool tools coming down the pipe. And a lot of you guys are gonna to wanna to get your hands on them and play with them. And the thing is, none of you wanna sit down and figure out how the stuff works and how I've got, what I have to do to spin it up, to integrate it into my workflow, to get to a point where I can be creative with it. You wanna sit down at your workstation and be creative. So that modular aspect really paves the way for these things to get rolled into your studio in the cloud, into your cloud-based workstation, so that you can start playing with all the new tech and experiencing this. So Nextera has a version of the same workstation that John's team's been using. You can reach out to me from my, my QR code there if you'd want to take this thing for a spin and check it out. We're, we're standing at the edge of a new frontier right now. There's no roads, there's no signposts, it's all up for grabs. By having a workstation sitting in the cloud like this, 
you get a seat at the table where the landscape's being mapped. So I urge you, get involved in this. Come sit at the table. Let your voice be heard. Right now, the processes, the methodologies, the best practices, all of that is being defined in this new era of storytelling. And you can have a voice in it. So now I'm going to pass it over to Patrick here. And he's going to tell you a little bit about laying a virtual art department on top of this infrastructure we just built. So I'm going to start covering about the uh, virtual art department in the cloud. I'm going to build on top of what uh, Chris talked about. A little bit about me. I've been working in uh, virtual production, or what is now termed virtual production, for about 15 years. Uh, and so here uh, at AWS, I'm focused on the, the creative content and bringing the virtual art department to the cloud. And so what is a virtual art department? This is where creative meets execution. This is where your artists work hand in hand with your filmmakers and your virtual production team to, uh, to build these sets in these environments and immerse you in the story. So the virtual production is like a mix of artistry and technology where you have to build these detailed uh, 3D assets and environments that you're going to deploy on the set and use for in-camera VFX. And that's really the key because you're now building these assets that are gonna be 20 feet tall, right? You don't want them to look like a PS3 game. And that's key because what happens is um, you're going to be looking at it with a different eye, right? If you're playing a video game, you're focused on the action, right? You're, you're very uh, accepting of what that environment looks like. But those who are gonna be looking at the, uh, this linear content, the audience members, they're gonna have a very discerning eye and they're gonna notice things and uh, the textures, the colors. If that is a linear movement, like a, just a tree moving like this, they'll catch it right away. And so the thing is that like, we talk about all the successes, right? Everyone talks about the successes in uh, virtual production, but I'll tell you, the ground is littered with these failures, and that's because you're not giving enough time, effort, to build these assets to the quality that you need to have to put up on that wall. So let's t dive a little bit deeper more into that. So what we're building here is kind of this virtual environment, which is a mechanism for those who are masters of their craft to be able to collaborate together. So those cinematographers, those production designers, uh, those directors, and you know, visual effects supervisors now have this common creative workspace, like a micro metaverse for them to work in. Right? The cinematographers can use this production technology to start doing virtual scouting and start doing blocking. The, like, the directors and the writers can now do script evaluation, right? Start looking for story. And then you're, you want to bring in the visual effects supervisor into this conversation because they do have the discerning eye that can take these computer graphic images and make, and make them look like they are integrated into this world, right? And so the cloud itself really is that an ideal environment. Ah, sorry. So the cloud really is that ideal environment to have a virtual production and this virtual art department because you're gonna have a lot of remote collaboration. You know, to create these assets, you need to find artists who are capable of delivering. And that's hard even in primary markets like London, New York, LA, let alone secondary markets like Sydney and Atlanta. And so how is it that you're going to build this and allow these people to collaborate remotely? Right? You, your cinematographer, when you're starting, they're on a different gig. You want to have them be part of that conversation. And so how do you make that work? And then as we continue this conversation, we talk about visual effects. Right? This industry is taking body blows. Right? And it's more than just the strike. They are, they've been grinding for a long time. And so say like Phil Tippett, right? mad god right, brilliant visual effects supervisor, he has said that like when he worked on Robotron, uh, Robocop, 
right? It was all about making the shot better. But now it's all about these stakeholders who are like barely engaged, all just trying to find the problem in the shot. And so how is it that you, you know, you're grinding these artists into the ground, just pick, moving all these pixels to deliver? And so what we're trying to do here is to create that creative space that where all of these people can have these conversations and start working and making these decisions. Because when you turn on that money spigot that is production and, it and it's just crazy amount of money and your weekly for your wall is really high, Right? You have to make these decisions about this juxtaposition about when is it that I want to make your decisions as late as possible, but when the earlier you make them, the cheaper it is. Right? What you don't want to do is get into the water world situation where it's just this exploding uh, budget. Right? And so again, we're, what we're trying to do here is how do we create a creative space for people to work? Okay. So with the John McInnes project, right, we have, we're having artists who were working from Vietnam, uh, Japan, North America, all the way to London and Poland, right? How are these people going to collaborate, right? And that review process and the approval is a critical part of that. So the re, you know, for content creation, right, it's this kind of two-stage cyclical process of, you know, continual review and change management, right, all progressing to have a final delivery, right? You know, you're working on these assets in the light and the color, right? And so you're talking to, I've talked to these companies, and what they're doing now is they're flying their artists with a workstation to who are directors who are on remote location. You know, how do you make this as frictionless as possible, right? You really want to make this friction free. Can I just be in my Unreal session and say, hey, I just want to share what I'm working on? You know, and it is about that sharing, but why does it have to be so clunky, right? Again, it's back to how do I make this as friction-free as possible? And so, right, like, again, artists, like, if you have that formal critique and that's fine, but artists want to be able to just share with other artists. Or maybe the soup wants to then uh, share it with a cinematographer who's at a remote location on an iPad. They need that time and space for the exploration. And that's really key, providing time for an exploration so you can make the shots better. Okay. All right, so let's step back a little bit and talk about the AWS global infrastructure. Again, so I said is we have, for the John McInnes project, you have artists from Vietnam to Poland, and that's all the long way around the, the globe. So how is the AWS global infrastructure going to support this production? So we start off, we have these regions, right? These regions are uh, this, in the physical world, you have a location. It's made up of three or more availability zones. Each availability zone is like one or more data center. Now these regions are isolated uh, from each other, so you can have fault tolerance, reliability, and stability. But what connects all of these is, what's, is the AWS backbone. And that backbone is this uh, fully redundant 100 giggy fiber network that just circles the globe and has this low latency, uh, you know, high throughput, uh, low packet loss, and just a really high quality of network. And on top of that, you have what is called the, uh, the Amazon CloudFront. And this is your content delivery network. Right? This is this global network of these points of presence, which are your edge. And from that edge, you can hop onto this fiber backbone and get to your Unreal session in the region. Okay. So we, so we started building this global review project in support of this uh, production. So what are the requirements for having this uh, a global review system? First off, we were gonna you'd be able to spin up uh, an Unreal session anywhere in the world, right? That artist who knows that they got to spin up and talk to someone in Germany needs to be able to spin it up in Frankfurt so they can have that reviewer can have the best low latency experience. Two, simple user interface. These artists, you know, back to the friction-free conversation. How do you get, how do you make it easy? This, like a two-page, three-page wizard just to spin up the session. Make it really, really easy. 
Three, you're gonna use the pixel streaming that comes built into Unreal. And what that gives you is the advantage that you can work in the browser. It already works on the iPad and Safari, which a lot of these creatives are using when they're remote. We're also, it's integrated with Perforce, and that's really important. So when you're working with virtual uh, production, you never package it, right? There's no cooking and baking process. You're actually running the Unreal Engine editor itself on the stage. So that means that the artists never think about packaging. So they're gonna be working in Perforce. So they upload their stuff to Perforce, and then uh, you just provide your credits and you pick your stream and you pick your project and you, put, and you pick your level, right? Ready to go. Take advantage of the latest GPU hardware. Again, that cinematographer out in the field on their iPad, they want to be able to uh, work and see what it looks like with ray tracing, because you're going to be ray tracing these scenes. And it's not like, you know, like a gaming console platform where you have eight gigs of uh, GPU RAM. You need more than that. And so you'll spin up an instance with 24 gigs. And last is uh, single sign-on. You know, your IT wants this, but then the artists also themselves, they just wanna be able to use the same credentials that they logged into Perforce to log into this system. Okay, let's dive a little bit more into some details. And here's a screenshot of the detail page. So some of the important notes is that um, once you start streaming this, you're gonna be able to connect uh, to this right from the browser or terminate it, right? And then you could copy the URL and then provide it to the reviewer. And a, a part of this is that you're setting a duration ahead of time. I wanna spin this up for eight hours. And what that means is that you know at that point what all your costs are, right? You know that these are the resources I am this, using. This is the instance. This is how long. So you know that it's gonna be like a four hour session is gonna cost you less than 12 bucks. And then you, you do your review session, you're done, you're two hours in, terminate it, right? There's no point in keeping these resources uh, and spending the money. And another thing is like, what, you know, what we tackled with this uh, global review project is that you know you're gonna be working with a studio. And so when you're working with their InfoSec security, these are the questions they're gonna ask you, right? Is it encrypted at rest? Is the resource secure by default? And then does it have least privilege access? And that's not just for the user, that's for all of your automated process. Next. Okay, it's Unreal Fest, so we can spend a little time digging into some of the technical details. Uh, people really like it. So the first thing to talk about is this project is being open sourced. It's being open sourced with a very permissive uh, open source license, MIT Zero. It's gonna be placed up on GitHub. That means you can take it and then integrate it with whatever production management software solution you have, that, so you know that the review session is over. F-Track, Chakrid, whichever. The second thing is that this is built on what's called serverless technology. That means you use the resources when you use them, and that if you're not using them, they're not spun up and it's not costing you any money, right? There's no 24-7 web server just waiting for input. Like, if you install it now and don't use it for the first month, you're not gonna have any charges. So let's take a look at number one there, the red number one. When you're spinning up your Unreal session in the region, you're gonna spin it up with Windows. Windows is the OS that is deployed on stage, right? And so, um, you know, you get all your, the hardware requirements and all the ray tracing you get with that, as well as that on stage, you, you stay within the lane of uh, virtual production that, that basically Epic tests. You don't go off the road, right? And so that really is Windows. But you can then provide an a starting image, right? What is that machine image that you start with, right? You could start with what Epic provides. They have one in the marketplace and you just agree to their terms of service and use that. Or you can continue to customize it and load it up with all of the plugins that you need. Or maybe you, wanted to, you do have a custom build. It's not common in, the virtual, you know, in virtual production. You usually stay with vanilla Unreal because um, you're working with a number of vendors on a, on a stage and there's a lot of hardware involved and you want to stick with what's tested. But you, if you do have a custom version of Unreal, you can load it into that image and make it available or use one that's in the stream if you have it in Perforce. The second 
number two over there on the left. So this is CloudFront, again, the content delivery network. You're gonna take, it's gonna take advantage of this in a number of ways. One, uh, you're, it's gonna use its certificate, right? Unreal is generally not have anything secured, so by using that certificate, that means your communication to the system is secured. Your WebSocket communication is gonna be secured, so it acts as that reverse proxy. And uh, as well as that you're now on the backbone to the Unreal session, which you know, gives you a much better experience. And then two is that you're doing authentication on the edge, which is really important because that means you know that when the person is reviewing, they've authenticated and then they're secure. And that Unreal session is actually locked to that CloudFront distribution, not allowing any co way to communicate it except through CloudFront. And then again, you're, we're using the uh, Amazon Cognito system, and that's kind of the user authentication. And it has a lot of options like multi-factor authentication, uh, and it also does like federated uh, services. So if, in this case, for us to do the single sign-on, we were using uh, Active Directory. Okay, um, over to number three. So when the artist instantiates the session, right, these are the steps that it's gonna go through. It's gonna start, it's gonna reach out to the region, start setting up the network, uh, copy the AMI or this machine image up there, but it's then gonna start cop making a copy from Perforce. And what the key part about that is, it's gonna copy it without making a workspace. It's just gonna take a snapshot, and it's not an ongoing because it's an ephemeral process. So you, now, because you're not creating a workspace, you're not cluttering up the artist experience because they're gonna be wondering what are all these workspaces for me. And then it's gonna spin up your session and then start scheduling termination for whatever that duration is. And last step, uh, again, whether it's the, uh, the artist in, uh, initial, or starts uh, the termination or whether you've hit that timeout point, it's gonna go through, terminate that session and then start uh, reaching out to all of the edge and disabling the distribution uh, as well and deleting it, okay? And that's it for me. So if you want to reach out, uh, here's my contact information. If LinkedIn is your preferred, that's great. Um, I put up a placeholder page where I've had some of these screenshots as well as the architecture. This is just a placeholder. And what that means is that the link and the content will uh, be replaced when we do open source it. We're right now we're in that closed beta. Uh, after this talk, I'll be downstairs in the AWS booth if, you wanna, if anyone wants to reach me there. Thanks. Back to John. Well, thank you, Christopher. Thank you, Patrick. Um, I was just in the audience there looking at it and thinking, wow, this is amazing. <laughs> and I'm so, I'm so uh, happy that we're making this. It's, uh, it's very, very cool. Um, but as a filmmaker, uh, my only concern, my real concern, is how all of this technology can serve our creative goals. So it all starts here, with the script, with the idea. Well, actually, it all starts out there in the world with the culture, and then it goes in my head, and then it, then it gets up on the, on the, on the page. So, um, last week, I was at the Academy Museum in Los Angeles looking at script from Citizen Kane. And the format hasn't really changed for nearly a century. And most screenwriting software seems to be stuck sometime in the mid-90s. I use Rider Duet because guess what? It's cloud-based. So once the script is in good shape, uh, I created a Google Sheets document so I can add to the script in ways that screenwriting software doesn't yet accommodate. At the same time, I was shopping for assets in the Unreal Marketplace for our real-time movie challenge. In this instance, when writing the script, I actually was writing the script knowing what assets were available and writing for that. And um, the real-time movie challenge gave us things, but the mood scenes that were created from the real-time movie challenge were essentially self-contained short films. And what we then needed to do was start tailoring those scenes, those scene files, to the specific needs of our narrative. And because we're working with artists all over the world and working on different scenes, I thought it'd be helpful to build those environments in SketchUp and storyboard the whole movie to get everybody on the same page. Okay, so next steps. So that's where we're at. You've seen our environments are well in their way to being made. Um, 
Um, and my team are busy building all of our digital characters. I'm keeping all these characters under wraps for now, so maybe save that for the next talk. And we finalized our cast earlier this year. So our next big step is mocap. So we aim to mocap all of our movie, a feature film, in six days. Now, we can do that, I and mean, that's realistic, because of all the work we've put in in preparation up until this point. Now, once we've captured our performances, we will have everything we need to put our movie together. So I've turned this production into a platform for experimentation and innovation. We're working with AWS and exploring a number of technologies that they have in beta, including a, a VPDK photogrammetry module for capturing assets, and NERF, scores and splats, AI, everything that we can be using this, uh, this movie to experiment to see what we can, we can use it for. So I would love to show how we're also leveraging UEFN as a big at the talk at the Unreal Fest this year. There's a lot about UEFN, which is and for, for good reason. We're leveraging UEFN for this production. Uh, unfortunately, that's beyond the scope of this talk, but I hope uh, in, the, in the near future we'll be able to talk more about that. So I'd like to thank Epic Games for giving me the opportunity to speak here today for the recognition that the mega grant bestowed upon the project and for all the innovative work that they continue to do. I'd like to thank our tech partners, AWS, and Nextera, and Perforce, and Patrick and Christopher for sharing the stage with me. But most of all, I'd like to thank you, the creative community, for supporting and participating in our little experiment. Your continued support is very much required. We're always looking to expand our tech partners. I'd love to hear from you if you, have, if you think that this production can add value to your product or company. And if you're a passionate developer and you think you can add value to our production and elevate your career through it, we would love to hear from you as well. And if you're an investor, uh, there are a number of ways in which uh, investors can capitalize on our success. Or if you'd like to just like what we're doing and want to support us and follow us, you can now use this QR code to follow us on social media. So this is the first time that we've revealed the title for our movie. And a hit movie, I think, in Unreal would be a game changer for everyone. So from here on out, bad vibes only. Thank you very much. <laughs>